statistically speaking, January is the biggest month for when people set intentions or resolutions to recommit to any number of things. These may be some of the top items that people set a, an intention toward. Losing weight, exercising more, eating healthier, saving more money, getting better organized. Did I miss any? If you're on Zoom, you can put a few things in the chat if you like. If you're in the sanctuary, did I miss any? A few, okay, but does, does that almost cover the list? A few, uh, I'm missing a few. Uh, those on Zoom, you'll have, to, you'll have to fill in for us. How many of us have ever set a New Year's resolution to improve ourselves in some way? Those on Zoom, I can't see you, but you can raise your hand if you like or put a thumbs up uh, to let folks know that yes, you too. I heard a two minute snippet of a podcast this week about how we are conditioned in our dominant culture to think about the new year every year it comes around. In her podcast, We Can Do Hard Things, Glennon Doyle said, the way that January gets branded is capitalizing on how much people hate themselves. There are all these advertisements. It's a new year, new you. It suggests that we hate who we are and we are simply waiting for the right month to come around so that we can change ourselves. A clergy colleague of mine in Northern California recently offered a two minute reflection about the new year, about getting a fresh calendar. A little aside, Angie and I went to Barnes and Noble on the fourth day of the month to get new calendars, waiting for them to be 50% off, of course. But I think they are on to people like us. <laughs> and they were not yet on sale. <laughs> and so I have to say, I'm sure I am already behind. <laughs> but this clergy colleague offered a two minute reflection about getting a fresh new calendar bare of any responsibilities yet, no accomplishments, no failures yet. And she said, I am so excited that this year, this new year, this would be the year that I am going to get more organized and disciplined. This clergy colleague is 63, 64 years of age. And then she said, I remember one of my friends telling me that I'm not much of a planner. And I was so worried and thought, I better become a planner this year because that's the way to be successful. Again, she's 63, 64 years old. And then another wise friend told me, she went on in this reflection, I think it's better for you to work out of your strengths. And she ended with, I am so relieved. In listening to these re two reflections this past week, I made the connection that our liturgical cycle of the lectionary, which comes around again and again at the beginning of January, offers us the baptism of Jesus every year like clockwork. It's a different message than our dominant culture gives us. Because the primary message of baptism is not to lose weight, it's not to exercise more, it's not to become more organized, it's not to save more money, it's not any, any of the other things that you might put on your resolution list. It is none of those things. The primary message of baptism is God calling Jesus, what? Beloved. In practicing our faith, the hope is that we too 
can begin to hear God calling us beloved. Later in the service, we will read the words of Jan Richardson's poem that you have in your bulletin that I sent out via email. It's called, Beloved is Where We Begin. In God's economy, that's where it always begins. Transformation and knowing one's purpose in life begins with the foundational understanding that we are beloved of God, not with any intention to lose weight, save money, exercise more, or get better organized, or whatever other New Year's resolution or intention we may have set. It begins, it begins with claiming our belovedness in God, and that, my friends, is a spiritual practice for a lifetime. It begins there, but it does not end there. It's continual. Not just once a year, at the beginning of January. Angie tells me that her observation is that this particular Sunday is my favorite Sunday to preach. And it's not because I've told her that it's my favorite. It's one of my favorites. Is it my favorite? I guess if I were a parent, I would say they're all my favorites, right? As you do your children, is that right? But there is something about this particular Sunday. Angie knows that every preacher has a core message that they preach. And over the years, she has recognized that this is one of the core messages that I preach. And it may be a core message precisely because I need to be reminded I need to be reminded of my own belovedness in God, that I am enough. At least on an annual basis, if not more frequently. It is also one that I believe everyone needs to hear and be reminded of. I am not alone and I know this to be true. And I know this because every year when I preach this message in this church, in other churches where I've preached this message, someone courageously tells me that they do not feel God's love, that they do not feel God's presence in their life, that they don't feel beloved of God. And the people who confidentially share this are often people who demonstrate selfless love for others. And it breaks my heart. And sometimes it's easier for us to see other people as beloved of God than to take that message into the core of our being. But it begins with us. It begins with us seeing Jesus as beloved of God, moving to us seeing ourselves as beloved of God and then recognizing that not just the people we love and care about are beloved of God, but God loves everybody. Although I still have that mouse pad that says, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. Because in a sense, we all want to be God's favorite, but we're all God's favorite. God loves us all. In her book, Searching for Sunday, theologian Rachel Held Evans, who died in her late 30s a couple of years ago, she wrote, Baptism reminds us that there's no ladder to holiness to climb. There is no self-improvement plan to follow. It's just death and resurrection over and over again, day after day, as God reaches down into our deepest graves and with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, rests us from our pride, our apathy, our fear, our prejudice, our anger, our hurt, and our despair. Those words from Rachel Held Evans. In each of the gospel stories, we hear God's words to Jesus in his baptism. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. 
And these words occur before Jesus has even started his public ministry. The last time for us that we saw Jesus was last Sunday when he was 12 years old. He's in the temple. But we don't know what has happened in these almost two decades of his life. His baptism occurs before his public ministry. It is true for us as well that God loves us from the beginning, not because of anything that we have accomplished. There is nothing that we can accomplish or do for God to love us more than God already does. It is because of who we are and to whom we belong. And our failures or what we see as our failures, or our sense of brokenness, or the, those places of woundedness, they also cannot keep God's love from us. From baptism, Jesus goes immediately from, from God's blessing for his life and for his being into the trials of wilderness temptation. It might be easy to think that this blessing and affirmation from God immunizes Jesus from future spiritual struggle, temptation in the desert, Gethsemane, the cross. It's like some people think that COVID vaccines should keep us from contracting COVID, but we have learned from science, is that the way it works? doesn't work that way, but it's bound to keep us out of the hospital or to give us less viral load. And I'll let Neva wax eloquently on all of the science behind it um, after worship is over. So spiritual blessing in our life does not immunize us from hardship or struggle. Beloved may be where we begin but it doesn't protect us from trial, tribulation, wilderness, temptation, or suffering. However, it can change what it is like for us to navigate that wilderness knowing that we are not alone. It shapes us for the journey. Throughout his ministry, Jesus returned to the source of these words, taking time of reflection with God in prayer, Returning again and again to the source, Jesus went away to a quiet and lonely place so he could pray, so he could return to his source of connection, the heart of love. One interesting thing that I've noticed about our dog Ivy, a yellow lab, I recognize it more than I did in Denali, our, our husky is that Ivy returns again and again to the source of connection at different times throughout the day. And she does this by lifting up her paw. And she wants to place her paw in our outstretched hands. And there is something physiologically that happens in this dog body when she places her paw in our hands her breathing slows, and I can literally feel her relaxing, and she just kind of slumps with her paw still in our hand. And if one of us removes our hand from her paw, she is quick to seek the source of connection again. And her paw's just hanging up here, but she needs to feel that connection, that she is loved, that we are there. It is in this paw to hand connection where she recognizes that she has returned to the source of all love and comfort. It's as if she needs to be reminded that we love her, that we are there for her. And it's Maybe like family therapist who has now died, Virginia Satir, S-A-T-I-R, once said about how many hugs we need a day. This therapist said we need four hugs a day simply for survival. We need eight hugs a day for maintenance. We need 12 hugs a day for growth. 
during the pandemic, I can imagine that most people aren't even getting the requisite four hugs a day for survival. And even if it weren't for the pandemic, it may sound like a lot of hugs in a day. But what is true that I know is that we are wired for connection. We are wired for community. And we really are not so different from our dog, Ivy. Although we probably don't go up to one another placing our paw in someone's hands. We might sometimes say, I need a hug. Or when somebody reaches out their arms, we fall gratefully into this space of nurturing. Or we experience that deep satisfaction of knowing that when we have told part of our story that we have been heard, that we have been held, if not physically, but emotionally, spiritually held. We too need to be reminded that we are beloved by God, by others, and that we are connected to one another. But we also find ways of dismissing our need for love and connection. We say, ah, that's for sissies. We don't need any of that. Or we deflect. We become masters of deflecting words of affirmation and love. Instead of allowing them to be planted and rooted in the depth of our being, the core of our being. So I'm going to invite us into an exercise that Henry Nouwen offered in his book, Life of the Beloved. If you are comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes to receive these words. Those of you on Zoom, you may want to, at this point, stop your video if you have it on during this portion so you can simply receive these words and not be self-conscious thinking that other people on Zoom are looking particularly at your screen. And so those are for the folks on Zoom. Um, or you may choose to keep your screen on. Let us enter into this exercise where Henry Nouwen quotes various scriptures, including themes from Isaiah 43, which Angie read. Jesus heard a voice when he came out of the Jordan River. I want you to hear that voice too. It's a very important voice that says, I have called you by name from the very beginning. You are mine and I am yours. You are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. You are my beloved child. I love you with an everlasting love. I have molded you together in the depths of the earth. I have knitted you in your mother's womb. I have carved your name in the palm of my hand and hidden you safe in the shadow of my embrace. I look at you with infinite tenderness and care for you with a care more intimate than that of a mother for her child. I have counted every hair on your head and guided you at every step. Wherever you go, I go with you. And wherever you rest, I keep watch. You belong to me, and I belong to you. You are safe where I am. Don't be afraid. Trust that you are the beloved. That is who you truly are. I want you to hear this intimate voice that comes from a very deep place. It is soft and gentle. Claim it for yourself because that voice speaks the truth, our truth. It tells us who we are. The spiritual life starts with claiming the voice that claims us, the beloved. 
these words from Henry Nowen from Life of the Beloved. This baptism story that shows up in all four Gospels this year, we read it from the Gospel of Luke. This story is about Jesus, and it is about us too. For the voice of God is meant for us too. The clouds may not part, the spirit may not come down like a dove. We may not hear literally the voice of God, but the message is for us as well. God wants us to know that we are beloved. Baptism invited Jesus to embrace his vocation and purpose as God's unique messenger, teacher, and healer. These words might also awaken within us, within us our own desire to be loved, affirmed, and called to be God's companions in healing the world and ourselves. Our spiritual lives begin by claiming the voice that calls us the beloved. And then we need to live the life of the beloved. And so if you haven't set an intention for the new year, or if you already have, I invite you to set that aside. And I invite you to take the belovedness challenge instead of making a New Year's resolution. May we begin to love ourselves as if we are God's beloved. If we persevere, persevered in noticing, claiming, delighting in God's love, more love might grow. We might see a subtle shift around us through embracing our own belovedness. We might recognize others as beloved of God as well. And then, in your mind's eye, take this word beloved and make two words of it. Beloved becomes be loved. That's like a commandment, isn't it? Isn't it? It's one thing to say you are beloved of God, but be loved. And then, take it out of the past tense. Be love. Can our lives be love in the world? Because we have claimed ourselves as beloved. Beloved, my friends, my beloved, God might say to us, be loved and then go forth to be love. May it be so. Amen.